Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. So if you all could just head back onto your seats. A couple of housekeeping things before we uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, once again, we're broadcasting this lecture over the internet. So for those of you in the room, when you have a question, if you could raise your hand, we have volunteers in the room. Someone will come up to you and just they'll bring you the mic. So please don't start speaking until the mic is with you, just so everybody can hear you and so they can hear you on the internet as well. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, the annual conference is coming up. That will be the next time we see everybody. We won't be having another lecture series until January, so the conference will be taking place November 12th at the Convention Center, and we really hope you all can make it. And if you want to register, you can do so online or by calling Judy. And also, please remember to fill out your surveys. I hope everyone got one of the beige surveys when you came in. We really do read every single one of those, and we take it all into heart, and your recommendations we do as much as we can, so please remember to fill that out and hand it in before you leave. And last announcement, this Wednesday is the SEI Awareness Day, taking place at the State House in the Hall of Flags. So we hope many of you can be there. This is sort of our time to talk to the legislatures, and they will be, they are, many of them attend the presentations. There'll be presentations from the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Uh, Dr. Wise Young will be there presenting his information on the work that he's doing, so it would be great if many of you can make it there. If you have any questions, you can um, call myself or Judy and we can give you some information. I believe you all probably have been receiving emails from us too on that information. So, I am very honored to introduce tonight's speaker. We're very lucky to have Dr. Andrei Krasiakov with us. He is a clinician scientist with a well-established track record in the area of autonomic dysfunction following spinal cord injury. He's the associate director and scientist at i -Cord. That he's the director of the Autonomic Research Unit, as well as a staff physician on the of the Spinal Cord Injury Program at GF Strong Rehab Center at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Krasiakoff serves as an adjunct professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario. He also has pioneered investig investigations on plastic changes within the spinal autonomic circuits using animal models and human spinal cord tissue. His research is supported by grants from the Heart and Stroke Foundation, the Rick Hansen Paralysis Foundation, the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation, Kentucky Spinal Cord and Brain Injury Research Initiative, and the Paralyzed Veterans of America Research Foundation. He's published more than 30 peer-reviewed manuscripts, book chapters, and reviews, and he's a member of numerous advisory boards for international agencies and involved in research in the area of spinal cord injury disability. Hopefully yours is, oh, there I go. Okay. Yes, can everybody hear me? Great. Good evening, thank you, Claudia, for introduction. It is a great pleasure to come back to Boston Medical and again to participate in this evening meeting with people with pancreatic injury, family members, and staff of the Boston Medical Center and I try today to speak to you as a person who is wearing two hats on the head. On one side, I'm a physician who is dealing on a daily basis with management of various conditions following spinal cord injury. But on another side, I'm also a scientist who is trying in the laboratory environment to solve some issues which you, some of you, people with spinal cord injury, experiencing personally following the spinal cord injury. And as you heard from Claudine, um, as a basic scientist working in the laboratory, this is a, one of the challenge which uh, many of us basic scientists experiencing when we see the issues which people with spinal cord injury with disability developed following trauma, how we can help. And sometimes basic laboratory is a great deal of help with this respect because we can answer some of these questions, modeling these issues in the laboratory, trying to challenge our mind with experimental design in animals, and then answer these questions, and then bring it back to the clinical practice, to the hospital, to help our patients. I will try today be realistically optimistic when I try to describe you and answer the questions how we can live with osteoporosis following spinal cord injury. I will try to prepare you with the respect that I probably will not have all answers for the all questions which you will ask to me, but I will try to present you 
present knowledge. What do we have at the present time? What we do know about osteoporosis after spinal cord injury. I also try to include some art of one of my favorite artists, Salvador Dali, and this series of these melting watches, plastiline watches, are somewhat remind me what's happening actually with bones after spinal cord injury. They're melting. They change their became plastic, and that's why you will see through the, my talk few paintings of Salvador Dali that this some kind of association, what we will see with changes of bone structures following spinal cord injury. So don't be surprised. That's why what objectives I put for myself when I plan this talk. I will try to introduce you, first of all, what is the physiology of bone in our body, what is the normal function of the bones and how bone structure is maintained during the period of our life, and introduce main important cells which are very, very important components of the bones and for the health structure. I will also to describe you what's happening immediately following the spinal cord injury with bone health and what's happening with the chronic stages following the spinal cord injury with the bone. I also give you some insight how we measure bone density and how good with these methods we are and what challenges actually medical professionals are facing when we're trying to precisely measure bone density in people with spinal cord injury and what differences when we're talking about density measurements in able-bodied individuals and in individuals with spinal cord injury. And there are a few challenges. And also, I will openly tell you, we have challenges with management and treatments of osteoporosis following the spinal cord injury. And then I finish slides with one slide, a little bit about history of Salvador Dali. Okay, this is again Salvador Dali, very interesting representation of these human bodies and skeleton structures, a skull. So, so let's talk a little bit about microarchitecture and normal bone physiology. For this, I chose a very good short movie prepared by Amgen. Let's listen to this short movie. The human skeleton gives the body its shape and provides physical support for the systems contained within. It also forms part of the musculoskeletal system that enables us to move. The structure of bone is optimized so that it is strong but relatively lightweight. The interior of bone is composed of bone marrow it is surrounded by two major types of bone tissue, cortical bone, or the hard outer shell of bone, and trabecular bone, the spongy looking center. The amount of each type of tissue in bone is dependent on the function of that bone. The basic unit of cortical or compact bone is the osteon. It is composed of successive concentric lamellae. This structure contributes to bone strength by resisting bending. Cells called osteocytes are distributed within the concentric lamellae. Osteocytes form a complex network that is thought to be important in maintaining the viability and structural integrity of bone. At the center of the osteon is the haversian canal. These canals contain blood vessels and nerves. The blood vessels within bone facilitate the exchange between osteocytes and the blood. Trabecular bone is present in the interior of some bones and resists compression. Osteocytes are also contained within its structure and again play an important role in sensing local changes in strain. Trabeculae are covered in a layer of flattened lining cells that are thought to be involved in the dynamic process by which bone is formed and broken down. 
bone marrow is found within the interior of bones. The surrounding trabeculae and vascular network provide structural support, nutrition, and a waste removal system for the heterogeneous group of cells found within this space. is a site for hematopoiesis, the process by which the cellular components of blood are formed. Bone is a dynamic tissue that is continually being built, broken down, and rebuilt in a process called bone remodeling. Bone tissue is broken down and resorbed by multinucleated cells known as osteoclasts. These cells are derived from monocytes, which originate within bone marrow. Osteoclasts play an important role in liberating minerals and other molecules stored within the bone matrix. Bone tissue serves as a repository for vital minerals including calcium phosphate and various biologically active molecules, such as growth factors. The release of calcium from the bone can play a role in maintaining its homeostasis within the body. The cells responsible for building new bone tissue are known as osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are thought to be derived from cells found to be associated with blood vessels. Once active, they start to produce the organic component of bone, osteoid, which is predominantly made of collagen. Minerals start to crystallize around the collagen scaffold to form hydroxyapatite, the major inorganic constituent of bone, which contains calcium phosphate. Density, or BMD, can be used to estimate the strength of bone and to assess the risk of fracture. As osteoblasts form new bone tissue, many become embedded within the matrix and differentiate into osteocytes. Structure, composition, and cellular processes that occur within bone allow it to simultaneously serve as a calcium reservoir while providing structural support for the vital organs and for locomotion. This two minute video contains enormous information, and I don't want you to remember all this long terms and long terminology. Three cells. You will try to remember, and we will go back to next slide to talk about osteocytes, osteoclasts, and osteoblasts. This is the three cells which I will ask you to remember because they will be very important for us to understand what's happening after the spinal cord injury. And another aspect which I also will ask you to realize many medical students who are coming to the anatomy and neuroanatomy class will feel that bone is some kind of dead tissue. It's not a muscle which contracting and walking. It's not a brain or neurons which are constantly firing. Bone is hard and lifeless. But you just heard that bones have blood vessels. Bones have nerves innervating bones. Bones has cells which are constantly active. That's why it's very active structure, very active organs. And this slide presents you actually very interesting, I don't have a pointer, right? Have very representative cycle in a healthy body constantly going through the reorganization. Healthy bone has constantly undergoing through the remodeling. First of all, we have a normal process when bone is organized and everything is okay. All cells living in a normal, healthy environment. But then every while, cells start actively eat bones, and this is absorption process, and this occurring through the activation of osteoclasts. They 
eat bone. And at this time, calcium produced into the, our bloodstream. Perfect, thank you. At the same time, osteoblasts, another group of cells, will build up the bone. They absorb the calcium from the bloodstream and deposit new layers of the bone, and they produce new bone, and then produce new bone and form new matrix, and that's why we call it mineralization. And this cycle continuously going all our life. And balance, very, very important. And if something happened with one cycle, then our bones became fragile and we develop either osteopenia or osteoporosis, and I will talk about this later. This is a healthy bone structure, and this is a bone which was affected by osteoporosis. But there are different levels of loss of bone tissue, and that's why there is a very common in medical terminology with grading from osteoporosis, osteopenia, or osteomalacia. And again, you don't have to remember this terminology. Most severe osteoporosis, less severe bone tissue loss, osteopenia. In osteoporosis, both calcium loss occur and both bone structure, the protein, collagen, which also deposit to main a microarchitecture of the bone is destroyed. In osteopenia, we only reserved tissue at lesser extent, extent in a bone, and bone became less severe destroyed in comparison with osteoporosis. This is obviously, this is examples of vertebral body on a cross section healthy vertebral body and vertebral body which is affected by osteoporosis, you will see. In medicine, we like to classify it any disease in order to understand what's happening. And there are few types of osteoporosis. One of the type of osteoporosis is a primary and there is a secondary osteoporosis. In the primary osteoporosis, there are type 1 and type 2. One of the common, and we have significant number of female ladies who will undergo causal changes are predisposed to develop osteoporosis due to hormonal changes in their body. This is unfortunately how he created you ladies. And this is a, one of the most common, obviously, type of osteoporosis that after 50, 65 years old, the predominantly spine and hip and raised bone lose a significant number of structure. Type two, senile osteoporosis, which both males and females affected with age. And at this time, hip and spine and pelvic bones affected both in the type 1 and type 2, predominantly with possibility we predispose to fractures of either oppressive fracture of our vertebral bodies or hip fractures. This is, we're talking about primary osteoporosis. Secondary osteoporosis, it's a big group of all kinds of osteoporosis developed due to variety of causes. And spinal cord injury is classified and put here. As well here, variety of osteoporosis which is used as a result of use of medication. And one of the common, which we do know, 
resulted from use by physicians when we have to prescribe, for example, hormonal therapy such as metprednisone. For long therapy, some of the conditions we're prescribing hormonal therapy such as steroid therapy, and this unfortunately will result in osteoporosis. However, pattern of osteoporosis following the spinal cord injury, and I will talk with you about this, it's not working. It's totally different in comparison with primary osteoporosis. That's why there are quite different about this. And timing of how it's developed. And so just a little bit about statistics about primary osteoporosis. There is 70% of fractures in people older than 45 related to osteoporosis. One third of individuals above the 65 have vertebral fracture. They're usually compressive fracture. Of individuals above 75, they are equal between males and females. We talk about senile type 2 primary osteoporosis. Hip fractures, this is a very important, are very, very dangerous for elderly individuals because dangerous with respect of mortality and individuals who. could develop pressure, which is pneumonia, and it's obviously usually result in significant results such as death. And it's already what I mentioned. Again, melting watch and melting skeleton. Let's start to Osteoporosis and changes in the bone structures following spinal cord injury. There are two methods. One of the densitometry, and I will talk about usually a little bit later. Early changes we usually expect biochemical changes. And one of them, urinary excretion of various markers of bone turnover or bone changes. Really? Okay. This is a little bit complicated slide, but I will go with you slowly. That's why there are two graphs. One graph is with the squares, which represent changes in calcium immediately following the spinal cord injury. And second graph represent in uh, squares which turn or rhomb rhombs, which represent changes in parathyroid hormones. Parathyroid hormones are very important for regulation of our bone structure. And as you can see, within the first few weeks following the spinal cord injury, this is, uh, in other things, red lines represent normal range of calcium and normal range of parathyroid hormones. As you can see, within the first few weeks, calcium level immediately going up and up and staying for quite a while on a very high level. We call this condition hypercalcemia because, bo because bone start to dissolve. Remember this bone eating cells, osteoclast. They became hyperactive immediately following spinal cord injury. Something changed in this balance of the cycle of bone turnover following spinal cord injury. And that's why level of calcium is significantly elevated. And sometimes we have to intervene in acute stage of spinal cord injury in order to maintain calcium level because calcium level could cause significant complication itself. And parathyroid hormone low also is not a very good sign. Sometimes we have to normalize it. And so this is a one of the 
example, what is happening with the bone changes immediately following spinal cord injury. This is another markers which we could detect following the spinal cord injury. Hydroproxylene is the changes of the elastic tissue within the bone. And again, it's the first one of the bone resorption increase within the first three months and continue to be elevated to eight months following the bone, following the spinal cord injury. Up to eight months, we see bone continuously to be reserved. Alkaline phosphatase, it's a one of the, again, active uh, enzymes of bone destruction and activity of these cells which actively destroying bones and other parameters. This is interesting slide. This is a parameters of bone density and comparison of bone density at different levels of the skeleton in the people able-bodied individuals in yellow and individuals with spinal cord injury in the blue. That's why let's look at the level of the spine. That's a vertebral body, able-bodied individuals, and individuals with spinal cord looks like do not change. Remember I mentioned you, primary osteoporosis, postmenopausal female, and senile osteoporosis. People losing But individuals with spinal cord injury do not lose bone density at the vertebral levels. This is interesting. This is something different. But what's happening, totally different, below the level of injury. This is also below the level of injury. But below the level of injury, we see progressive decline at the hip, at the femur, at, at the tibia. And majority of fracture we know from the literature and from clinical experience, majority of the fracture right around the knee. the tibia. A little bit busy slide, but again, just to summarize, what's happening with acute period of bone loss following the spinal cord injury? Cord injury result in general osseous tissue loss. Initially, it starts with osteopenia, and there is, as I mentioned to you, it's a both uh, bone resorption immediately following the uh, for spinal cord injury. And the majority of these markers immediately elevated in the first weeks, as I showed you. But it's continuous up to the first year. And there is a, some even data showing that up to two years, we still see continuous resorption of the bone after spinal cord injury. More rapid loss occurring in the distal femur and proximal tibia. And this is exactly area where majority of fractures we see clinically in the people with spinal cord injury. Bone loss in low extremities continues to decrease for the next one to three years following the spinal cord injury. And what I mentioned to you is that vertebral bone mass does not significantly change following the spinal cord injury in comparison with osteoporosis, with uh, primary osteoporosis. And you can think about this or you can ask question why. We can talk about this later. What's happening in the chronic period after spinal cord injury and osteoporosis? That's a pattern of the loss of bones is quite different. And this is what happening next. I will show you just numbers, what we know from the densitometry by the percentage of loss of bone. As you can see, if we talk about from the femur, from the proximal femur to the 
Calcaneus, the first born from the level of injury, like more bone is lost, more severe loss of bone occurring than proximal, more distal from the level of the injury. Low extremity does not differ between paraplegic and tetraplegics. Looks like if it is below the level of injury, both individuals with tetraplegia and paraplegia suffer similar bone loss. Even though we know there is a very big difference in comparison, for example, cardiovascular dysfunction, some bowel dysfunction, here looks like there is no big difference. Looks like there is other aspects playing this role. Upper extremities in paraplegia have increased bone density mass. Individuals with tetraplegia obviously have decreased bone mass in the upper extremity because it's again below the level of injury and this is again probably as a result of loss of innervation and also loss of activities. And again, with spine, as you can see, spine, both in tetraplegia and paraplegia, has even data increased. And here, probably because majority of market injury, sitting and wheelchair have what people, individuals with able body, what we do, we're putting pressure on our bones. This is a major factor which influence preservation of the bones. We need gravity in order to preserve the bone and maintain the balance between the osteoclast and osteoblast. They need continuous support of gravity. And that's why vertebral bodies have a pressure when person sitting, that's why vertebral body receives this pressure with the gravity and that's the bone structure and bone formation continuously produce this pressure and gravity do not affect significantly vertebral body following this pancreas. Age and spine cut injury continued bone decrement with a longer SCI. However, this is a very small group of studies with twins. That's why similar to the aging population, person with spine cut injury with age, in addition to spinal cord injury, that's why it is a secondary osteoporosis, they will develop a primary osteoporosis due to aging. That's a double jeopardy, unfortunately. And this is again to emphasize gradient of loss of osteoporosis depend on the where bone was tested. Let's talk about how we are seeing bones right now. There are a variety of methods. Some of them used only in research. Some of them we're using in clinic very radically and sometimes physicians will look just on x-ray and can say you, oh, you have osteopenia or you have osteoporosis. But the quantitative assessment, precise measurements at the present time we're doing with doing x-ray measurements through the DEXA. This is a quantitative measurements where we can definitely precisely measure how much bone structure is preserved or how much bone structure is lost. Um, it is machines, varied technologies, varied company produced, but idea is the same. Person is positioned into the special uh, bed and this equipment going through the uh, above and below person and then report will be given about the specific region of the person. At the present time, 
be using a standard protocol which was developed for able-bodied individuals. And in able-bodied individuals, we focused on lumbar region and hip. As you remember, I told you these were predominantly regions where individuals able to be fractured, develop fractures. And as you remember, I mentioned to you that individuals with spinal cord develop fractures at the knees. And unfortunately, protocol for the knee DEXA still is not well established and well, well accepted around the world. That's why we're still using dexometry for the able-bodied individuals. And I will show you a few problems which we have clinically. But before I will give you some terminology when you probably will receive report to talking with physician how to understand when person comparing you score somebody else. That's why we're using few scores, T scores and Z scores. T scores. It is a comparison of your bone density in a specific region of your body with hundreds and hundreds healthy, young, 20 years old individuals of your race and your gender. That's why it will be if you're white, female, and you're 60, still we give you T score of females who are 20 years old. It's a maximum born health. And that score, it's a comparison of your age matched and your sex matched bone score. Then you will know how you stand with respect of your score to your peers or your bone score with a young population where your bone was at most perfect health. World Health Organization has classification and that's why you will see also in your report variety of numbers. Normal bone density has to be laid down within the one standard division. Then you're okay. If it's falling below one standard deviation, then you falling within stopinia range. Every single drop by one standard deviation increase your risk for fractures. This is a typical report which probably says a green area is good. Orange yellow area is osteopenia, osteopenia, and then red area osteoporosis. Very funny. Some of my patients has minus 6.5 osteoporosis. And they live normal life, they're doing crazy stuff, they're jumping from the uh, aircrafts with parachutes and don't listen to me. Life is going on. It cannot stop you from doing what you're planning to do. These numbers should not scare you. But we have to know what does it mean and then take appropriate thinking and take appropriate measures together what we can do realistically and plan our lives. So that's why this is a typical, that's why if you're in the green line, you're 
obviously fracture risk is zero. And then if you're going below standard into the orange and red line, then you predispose to higher level of fractures. Accuracy, precisions are very, very difficult with uh, individuals with spinal injury, and I will show you why. That's why there are, again, beautiful Dali picture. Variety, we can, as I mentioned, we can do it at the lumbar region, we can do it at the hip using protocol from able-bodied individuals, or we can try to use newly coming right now from research area protocol for the knee, but it's not established at every single hospital. And we don't have a big, large database for the normative di data, how, what we have for the lumbar region and for the hip at the present time, unfortunately. That's why if we look, uh, it's too bright. If we take, for example, this is a lumbar spine, looks like fine, but unfortunately there is a laminectomy was done in this individual. That's why this lost bone is already making an error in calculation of a precise bone density for the lumbar spine. That's why to calculate in this individual's bone density following the laminectomy, which we sometimes have to do after spinal cord injury for decompression, is incomplete and imprecise. For many individuals with spinal cord injury, we have to do instrumentalization and rods inserted and screws inserted we cannot calculate bone density in this case. Due to will be in a and again, we are out of luck with the precision and precise calculation of bone density in this lumbar spine. That's why this is a challenge which we are facing with calculation of bone density in a vertebral bodies with spinal cord injury. Hip, very commonly I see in my patients dislocation of the hip, and if hip dislocated and neck of the hip is a not correct angle, we cannot correctly estimate uh, bone density at the hip. Hip can be dislocated or contracted or heterotopic ossification commonly formed in this area. And again, we are in trouble with estimation of the uh, bone density using a standard protocol which is accepted for the able-bodied individuals. This is a challenge. Not good, right? There is a few research done in Canada and US to utilize a lumbar or vertebral body protocol to assess bone density at the level of the knee. And you can see here, this is a typical level where the fracture occurs. This is a fracture in a femur, which is a common fracture level for the people with spinal cord injury. So, so right now, this is more and more coming to the practice. But again, it's work in the program because we are needed right now to implement in the practice widely because this is exactly where majority of people of spinal cord injury will be interested to measure their bone density. Just so in conclusion, with respect to bone, bone density, bone mirror knee region is presently is reliable met method of measurements, but unfortunately still software is uh, developed but not in a widely used. And uh, currently used is only in a few research laboratories and not widely accepted across North America and around the world. And already, I believe, we talked with you that um, the most common dysmetric pattern of spinal cord injury 
it is normal at the level of spine, which is different from the primary osteoporosis and loss at the knee and tibia. Ruling out of secondary causes of osteoporosis, it's again very important question which I just don't have time to talk in this one hour. Ladies will also could pause and then we have to deal with osteoporosis. Men with spine cut injury commonly develop I highly recommend and always do it. patients with spine cord injury checking testosterone level and if testosterone level I will highly recommend to normalize testosterone level because it's one of the secondary causes of possibility of develop uh, secondary causes of low bone density. And then here we're coming to the issue to treat or not to treat and I intentionally put a big a number of slides about the bifosphonates, and I will be happy to answer questions about this. Because unfortunately, fantastic results in able-bodied population. Bifosphonates worked wonderfully in postmenopausal uh, osteoporosis. Few clinical trials which were we done with a few bifosphonates. Bifosphonates, as you know, medications which we are trying to t use in the people with spinal cord injury. So we're not very successful in individuals with spinal cord injury. There were somewhat promising results in a, with alendronate when it showed some decrease of loss of bone within the first six to 12 months after initiation, early following spinal cord injury, but unfortunately when we compare later for the 12 and two years in treated and untreated groups, the results were absolutely the same. Right now there is a few new latest form for fourth generation of bifosphonates in clinical trials such as an endronic acid. We still don't know how it's working. Uh, how effective it is. That's why, unfortunately, I cannot give you care for the with respect of uh, bifosphonates. If my patients will insist with discussion, I will start bifosphonates. But in reality, clinical evidence do not show significant effect bifosphonates in people with spinal cord injury who do not ambulate regularly or who do not pr produce sufficient time withstanding because this is unfortunately number one benefit which can be improve osteoporosis. I will start uh, again prevention. That's why for prevention post uh, injury osteoporosis is still could be improved and we still don't have uh, good results with them. Unclear if it's, if it's effective at all. We don't know about duration of these medications. Plus, uh, we, in a few cases, as we know, majority of our population is young. And when we started before with bifosphonates and then young lady will planning to become a mother with these treatments, we have to then stop bifosphonates in appropriate time that they will be eliminated from the organism before the, she will start to plan her reproductive function and so on. That is a rough issue which always has to be considered. And then obviously we don't know what happens when we will stop bifosphonates and uh, with uh, follow-up. With final quotes, eat healthy and balanced diet. We do know that proper diet for 
person with spinal cord injury, it's absolutely paramount, not only for the bowel and bladder function, but for proper nutrients and audio bone reconstruction continuing all going on, and that's why proper protein intake, proper calcium intake is absolutely important. Vitamin D, you probably do know, received enormous amount of attention during the last few years, not only for the bone density, but also for cancer prevention. I'm coming from the province in Canada where we have sunny days counting in hours. That's why my patients, are recommend I'm recommending to my patients to receive from one to 2,000 vitamin D on daily basis. That's why in uh, sunny California or sunny Boston, probably still 1,000 units of vitamin D is appropriate for individuals with spinal cord injury. And then with calcium intake, there are some evidence in the literature that if you are stone former, and we do have them, some individuals do have tendency to form blood stone with increase of calcium intake, then you have to be a little bit more careful with uh, uh, supplements of calcium. And then you have to just rather take probably uh, yogurt, uh, cottage cheese, and elementary calcium could sufficiently substitute your daily calcium intake rather than take calcium carbonate or calcium citrate which decrease your possibility of calcium formation, of calcium stone formation in the blood or kidneys. Smoking, caffeine, and alcohol. Smoking and caffeine will increase calcium removal from your body. It's bad, bad, bad. And I'm talking only for the bone health. I'm not talking anything else. That's like, do consider how many cups of coffee you're drinking and obviously how many cigarettes you are smoking. And then obviously alcohol, when you drink more, then your habit with respect to food and everything changes, and that's why altogether you have to be very, very careful with these respects. Exercise, here this is a very challenging issue in Canada, we just uh, came with new recommendations for exercise for people with spinal cord injury. It is guidelines at the present time recommend that three times a week, at least 30 minutes of exercise is very crucial for cardiovascular health. But obviously with respect of osteoporosis, there is a, some evidence that functional electrical stimulation of low extremity will increase bone density. Obviously, we have some evidence from body weight support training, but again, to become, I will say, not addicted, but take a balance between standing eight hours a day in a frame or live a life, what is most important? I will say live a life. Uh, yes, standing chair is good. Standing chair is good. That's why this is a trick which we learn together. Standing chairs, if you appropriate candidate, it's perfect idea. And here definitely what is the next? Working with physical therapists, working with physiatrists, consider appropriate equipment which could help both for your appropriate activities for your appropriate level, and depends what question you want to solve for your body, for your soul, for your health. Because again, we clearly understand osteoporosis is only one issue in your body. It's only one issue in your health. There are so many issues we have to solve. When you're exercising, you have to protect your bones, you have to protect your joints. You have to always walk carefully and your physical therapist and uh, obviously aware about that you cannot 
overactivate, overstretch, overuse your joints. And this, again, precautions which I have to take. And uh, there is a wonderful website available um, how to live with osteoporosis on a website which I recommend you to visit. I will finish with a short slide about Salvador Dali, who is a Spaniard. He's married to a Russian lady. You probably recognize that my accent is not Canadian. and I will be ready to answer questions. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, we need microphone, please. Again, I definitely, I told you from the beginning, I will not cover everything in my lecture. It's an enormous big topic, enormous big topic, but I try to address at least major issues, but I'm ready. One of the things I've found is that I know there's prescription calcium supplements of various sorts, and there's umpteen different sorts of calcium supplements with bone, bone meal and coral meal and so on. Is there any particular things that we should look for in a non-prescription supplement, and it, besides the calcium, I mean like what it's made from or other ingredients that it contains? I always use two criteria. What you can afford and what you can digest. Cheapest and less harmful for your stomach. Calcium gluconate, there is, it's like a brick in your stomach. If you take calcium gluconate, that's what, what we know from the few studies, they sometimes could stay in your stomach for a week without dilution and resorption. Calcium trade looks like resorbs quite quicker and better. What about like bone meal? Sorry? What about things like bone meal? It's naturopathic medications which I don't know, we don't know data how quickly they're reserved. This is a one of the issue. This at least, with this medication, with this, it's over counter. They are quite reasonably priced. That's why at least we know how they are acting. The rest, this is one of the challenges that there is so many of them, then we're getting to the area where difficult to answer but at least from the well-tested over-counter medication, I will recommend which well-reserved well in your stomach and then pressed. Calcium citrate is. Any other trace minerals or other things along that line that would be helpful? I, know I see various claims that they add various things that are supposed to make the calcium absorb better and so forth. And I calcium don't know how much phosphate that's and it's two most, most important aspects you need. Yes. First of all, I want to commend you on an excellent and well prepared talk that I think sure. all of us enjoyed. I happen to be a physician and I happen to be a tetraplegic and I have lots of questions I'm going to restrict my questions to you okay. today. My first question is, I'd like your thoughts on the administration of either zolindrolic acid in a parenteral fashion or the administration of strontium. It's one of the... ...microarchitecture in a small group of people with spine cord injury. We don't have a larger study. That's why answer is we still don't know. I would like to see a big group of patients studied with the lindronic acid. Uh, this is all what we know from the literature. There is a two clinical trials at the present time registered on the uh, 
um, NIH.gov or governmental system clinical trials, clinicaltrials.gov, which are studying zolindronic acid, but we don't know. It's only one published so far I know. Strontium, again, it's micro elements, suggestion is good. There is no clinical trials, especially the one we did in Germany. We don't have evidence of the clinical trials. <coughs> Veronica, good idea. I'll try to see the last I'll try to see that. Second question. I happen to be one of those people who developed heterotopic ossification, and I had a DEXA scan done nine months after my injury. How often would you recommend a DEXA scan to be performed? Um, I am guided by the But I would like to my patients, and once it's what my system allowed me, twice a year. Oh, that's why. How many years after? Huh? One. One year. The for clinical purposes, ideally, I would like to do immediately after the discharge from acute care for the first time, establish your baseline, and then at least a year to see where you, how quickly you lost what you lost. And then actually every two years, it's quite sufficient to see where you're standing. And then if on either I'm putting them on fossil marks, or it's sufficient enough to see maintenance. And I don't want to hog it, but just one last question. For my memory of physiology, in a normal patient who had taken 1,000 milligrams of calcium, they would excrete 900 milligrams. And th in a healthy diet, is there any indication, frankly, for the supplemental administration of calcium? That's what I mentioned. If we balanced good diet with yogurt, uh, cheese, milk, you don't need supplement. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Um, it, thank you for the presentation. Um, I I uh, was wondering. You you mentioned in your slide about uh, alcohol and caffeine. I've also heard that um, soda is very bad for the bones. Is that correct? Uh, Something yes. in, in that that they put in, in soda. Coca Cola. Coca Cola. You're those, yeah. Uh, you're absolutely Coca correct. Soft drinks is not good either. What, what in the soda is bad for the bones? Um, I have to think about this. You caught me. <laughs> Caffeine. Caffeine, one of the component. Many. It's a caffeinated, well, majority of them caffeinated. That's why you're drinking caffeine. Yes, please. I have a question. Um, what about um, taking folic acid? I don't acid? hear you. Oh, um, about taking folic acid. Oh, what about taking folic acid? Don't hear you. Folic acid. F for bone density? Yes. It's not very well established specifically for bone density. Folic acid we know, do know very well for the anemia, but not for bone density specifically. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, this lady on the left. Uh, my question is, does Good. the Level off, so you don't have to worry about it anymore, and how many years does that take? 
that's why right now we believe that within the three years looks like resorption I'm sorry. is so could, could you ant, um, repeat the question yeah. the people on the webcast can't hear question that. question was if born loss after certain period time following spinal cord injury even or there is continuous bone loss following spinal cord injury going on. What I showed you in my slides, there is looks like acute period up to first year, or there is data showing up to three years ongoing bone resorption going on. There is looks like data showing that after this, it is sturdy state occurring. And then, person going into this equalizing stage. We have a few questions on the webcast. Yes. And um, one question is our- Just a second, just a second. Except, as I mentioned to you, as a female, you unfortunately will come to the stage of menopause and you will be in double jeopardy with this primary osteoporosis. And as uh, we all getting not younger, we all undergo secondary due to aging osteoporosis. That's why we will go additional osteoporotic changes due to other conditions. That's why this we have to keep in mind. Yes. Uh, we're wondering if the if your description of bone changes holds true for non-traumatic SCI, which doesn't have a distinctive time of injury. If person, if disability, if we're talking about other disabilities, if disability include, for example, if person with multiple sclerosis confined to wheelchair and cannot ambulate the pattern of bone density could be very similar. People with uh, spina bifida, I see also develop very similar osteoporotic changes. However, one of the interesting aspect what we didn't have time to discuss, bone has innervation as I mentioned to you. And looks like there is a very interesting aspect of autonomic innervation of bone also playing in a osteoporosis following the spinal cord injury, which we just start to learn from the latest research, which we just at the beginning of discovering what autonomic nervous, play, uh, nervous system playing in a bone loss following spinal cord injury, which is not happening in multiple sclerosis, which is not happening in other conditions. But still, if person can find, unfortunately, to wheelchair, then obviously loss of possibility to ambulate, possibility to have this gravity impact on a bone plays major role in a similar changes what person with spinal cord injury experiencing. There was also a discussion about standing frames on the webcast and how people might be able to get one if they're very helpful. Can you talk about standing frames? That's what I just mentioned. In order to get effect from the standing frame, you probably have to stand eight hours a day. That's what, what people, ambulating people do. They have impact eight to 12 hours a day. Is it a life to spend eight hours a day in a standing frame? I do love standing frame. Standing frame are fantastic for control of spasticity. Standing frame fantastic for controlling cardiovascular problems, orthostatic hypertension, but for osteoporosis, probably not. Thank you. Is this question here? Yes, I have a question. Um, 
I was spinal cord injured at birth, at delivery with the forceps. So I've been really, really afraid of the doctors around here. And after hearing your lecture, I'm really, really afraid. Um, well, in my case, they tried the biphosphonates by pill, and I had several rounds of vomiting. So then I had three years of permidronate by IV, and then they told me they had to stop because it caused cancer. And then now I've been on three years of reclass. So um, in both cases, my density improved in the spine, and it went down in the hip. Now, to decide on whether to continue reclass, they said continued use can cause cancer. So what I want to know is, what is your opinion about permidronate and reclass? And given the fact that I have severe IBS. Okay. What you describe right now is that's why, first of all, I have very short history of your condition. It's very difficult for me to make a decision on this description. But at the same time, you describe exactly typical picture of improvement of bone density in your spine following the treatment with bafosphonates because your spine received ongoing vertical support and pressure, which what I showed you, individuals with spine cut injury received continuous pressure because by sitting in wheelchair, you continuously provide this vertical support and pressure on your vertebral body. Similar what any standing ambulatory individuals provide support on every single bone, and that's why your bone density actually improved, but in one part of the body and did not improve in any other parts, correct? That's why here it is your decision. You are in charge of your body, and here I am sitting down with my patients and make decisions individually. You describe the typical complications from Fosamax when you develop gastrointestinal complications, which unfortunately is very common. Despite all the recommendations, we do know you have to sit for half an hour and drink with plenty of water. Many of my patients will develop these side effects. And nothing else we can do. All medications have uh, double age sorts. That's why talk with your physician very frankly. Is it really beneficial to me? Is it really worth to continue to do these treatments? In a way, as a lady, you're protecting yourself from compressive fractures of the vertebral body. It's amazing, from the birth you are doing very well. Hmm? And I'm 62. Yeah, it's amazing. It's absolutely yeah, I'm amazing. I'm 62. Yeah. But I never took, um, what do you call it, hormone therapy. Mm -hmm. When I got menopause, I refused. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is there a question right here? I also would like to thank you for an excellent. Uh, thank you very, very interesting topics that you're well covered. Um, in a post-menopausal with primary and secondary uh, osteoporosis, what is your recommended uh, calcium intake from the diet? I was told 1,500 milligrams. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Can That's right. Okay, I'm sorry. Yep. If you calculate your intake, elementary count, 1,500 a day. Okay, and what is... If you're not smoker, not drink no. a lot of coffee, it will be fine. 
And what's your claim? What's your thought on uh, vitamin D3? <sighs> okay. I think that answers it. <laughs> <laughs> and upper body weightlifting. Good. It's good for the tonus, for maintaining your cardiovascular as well, exercise, fitness. It's good. It's very good. If you have it predisposing compression fractures, is there any contraindication? No, because you're not loading anything. Okay. Thank you very much. Not contraindicated at all. Any exercise is good if you're doing it correctly without over loading your joints, do it with uh, supervision of your physical therapist or your trainer, you will not harm. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, in, um, I work, uh, I'm a nurse practitioner in a practice uh, with um, all restricted to adults with physical disability, and we have many people with cerebral palsy, and some of them are young, still in their 20s, and this DEXA scan, of course, shows osteoporosis. And they've been uh, prescribed Fosamax and the other bi bisphosphonates. But I'm gathering that it's really not going to be very effective for the areas with that they're most likely to fracture. And also, I'm concerned about starting them on the medication so young. And if they do it, what would be a reasonable time? Five years? Or, I mean, do we have any data about doing these for a long I mean, we're starting to think of just taking them off these medications because the evidence seems more applicable to middle-aged women than to young people with CP. It's again, they're totally uh, confound to the bed. They're not w ambulating at all. Okay. Yeah, so there is no again evidence. Yeah, wheelchair, yeah. Yeah, no evidence, no evidence. Yes, please. Is there any thoughts on taking vacations or breaks from the biosphosphates uh, on for a few years, off for a few years, on for a few years? Or at, at this point, you just really don't see any great benefits, period? I will answer on this question with my study. A couple of years ago, I, listening to this question from my patients, I thought, am I only alone with some kind of listening questions from my physicians? And there is no rules, actually. There is no guidance how to manage osteoporosis after spinal cord injury. And I did a study asking physicians across Canada. I developed a questionnaire, and I sent every single physiatrist in Canada a long list of questions. Who you are, how long have you been in practice, how many patients with spinal cord injury you have, what you're doing for the osteoporosis in your practice. And answers coming back were following. I'm doing nothing. I don't know a lot about, osteo about osteoporosis. I heard about osteoporosis, but there is no evidence. And frustration, I realized that frustration about the osteoporosis was so big across the, my country. And then I found the same frustration actually across North America and across the world. That's why during the last few years, situation changed. There is a guidelines came out. And recommendation which I put together in my last thoughts came from the guidelines on osteoporosis for spinal cord injury. No coffee, no alcohol, no smoking, vitamin D, calcium supplements, and bifosphonates, unfortunately, not in guidelines. That's why we don't know yet, we do not have a strong evidence to stop or not to stop. Will it harm you in a later or not? I cannot answer you Just with the confidence. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow-up. I was wondering if you're aware I've participated in a study through the VA hospital the last five, six years. I was told there's one of the largest uh, osteoporosis bone density studies. Are you familiar with it all? Or? Yes, yes, I'm familiar with this, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm on this actual review panel for VA for numerous years. 
Mm. I was spinal cord injured 15 years ago, and about a year after my accident, I got an easy stand, which I used for a couple of hours a day for uh, two, about two years, but I've been bad. I haven't used it for about 13 years. And I'm wondering, is it dangerous for me to get it out of the basement and start using it again now? Um, <laughs> could I okay, um, put myself in it so that I'm partially standing to start? It's no most important what we worry about the sudden impact, fall. If you're standing in a frame, there is no significant danger of. Um, ha have you seen the movie A Murder Ball? Yeah. Murder Ball. You know, the, you know who created the game? Canadians. It's really my patient. My patient created the game in Winnipeg, and Winnipeg, Manitoba. Do you know what the bone density of majority of these guys? Minus six. And they're playing this game. They're falling from the wheelchairs. How often I see bone fractures? Not a lot. But sometimes when they definitely something happened, most of the time, when they fall with knees forward. This is in fact what commonly causes the bone fractures. That's why if you do your frame standing with the guidance first time with your physical therapist, it will not, should not cause any problem. Yeah. About three times a week for an hour a day. This I was is hoping a, that would be helpful. Yeah, this is a good help. There is a data that showing that functional electrical stimulation actually improve bone density in the low extremity. Okay, we're going to take just a, uh, one or two more questions from the web, and then we're going to wrap up. Um, we have a question about um, whether or not you recommend using whole body vibration or human growth hormones. Yes, uh, there is a coming, few papers came out from the whole body vibration that there is looks like improvement of bone density. Few studies, very small number of patients. That's why I would like to see larger studies with larger number of patients, but looks like improvement is there. I don't know anything about the effect of growth hormone on the bone density. There is no evidence. That's why I cannot say. Thank you. Dr. Krasnikov, thank you very much. Pleasure. This was great. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you.